Shalom, shalom. Welcome, welcome, world changers. Tonight we're going to get into the gospel of Pseudo Matthew. The gospel of Pseudo Matthew. Uh, it's along the same theme as the uh, infancy gospels. In fact, it's actually classified as one of the infancy gospels. And uh, some of the things that we have in the, uh, the gospel of Pseudo Matthew is also. Uh, found in uh, some of the other infancy gospels that we have read. So, yeah, um, we're going to read that as at least some of it. It is a, a little bit of a lengthy gospel, but we'll read, we'll get into that. Um, and I also got a comment as usual. I want to uh, um, speak to and also a critical thinking tip. So welcome, welcome, welcome everyone as usual. Uh, I pray that every one of you would be very blessed in everything that we share and talk about today, that it would increase your knowledge of the scriptures, your knowledge of the things of heaven and your relationship with God. Amen, amen. All right, so uh, what we let me see what we have here in the live chat. First, we have Kalamentos says, Shalom, everyone. Shalom, Kalamentos. Sayer says, Shalom, 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 Shalom. Welcome, good to see you. Welcome. Okay, so... The comment that I want to address here is a comment that I received on TikTok. I received this uh, comment on TikTok. Um, says one day ago, so it's not it's not that old. And this is a comment that is pertaining to the uh, the Torah. Uh, one of the uh, videos that I posted a few days ago uh, was a video that. Uh, Basically, what I was talking about was how we need to. Uh, it's 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 easy to obey the Torah, and uh, you know we we need to do whatever we can to obey the Torah, to obey the the law of God. And of course, you know you always get this kind of thing whenever you're talking about the Torah. You you always get this kind of thing, especially especially from the Christian community. So Yamaha guy nineteen says you follow all six hundred and thirteen laws? Question mark question mark. No way. I don't believe it. I don't believe it. No one can. That's why we need Jesus. You're claiming we can be perfect. Okay. Well, um, let's, let's look at this comment bite by bite, if you will. And, uh, I want to, you know, I just wanted to, uh, to go through this, especially for those of you who are Torah observant, those of you who are out there preaching the truth, and you're going to come across a lot of this stuff. And if, uh, unfortunately, this this kind of stuff is actually uh, the fruit of what I call the modern corrupt Christian narrative. Uh, anymore today, if you uh, you know if you want to be a Christian and you go to church, and especially if it's a if it's a you know, uh, an evangelical church that might uh, have altar calls, they call them, where you can go up, go forward and, and say the sinner's prayer and receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior. And, you know, before you know it, uh, you'll, have a, you'll have your back pocket full of a bunch of, a uh, uh, handful of, uh, a mitt full of Christian cliches. And uh, most of these cliches are just selling points and sales pitches of why we need Jesus, okay? One of those points uh, it says that, you know, that we, we, there's no way we can obey the, the Torah. There's no way we can obey the law. That's why we need Jesus. Okay, that's, that's a sales pitch that is really not in accordance with the truth of Scripture. Let's see here, by the way, we have Psalm 94 says, Shalom, everyone. Shalom, Psalm 94. Good to see you. Yeah, so um, let's talk about this bite by bite because you know y'all we all need to kind of sharpen our swords so to speak figuratively speaking when it comes to our knowledge of the scriptures 
And so, yeah, this is very, very common. You, you know, someone would uh, object by saying, you know, you can't follow all 613 laws. No way. You see, so this particular person obviously heard the, the, the sales pitch that there are 613 laws and that's way too many laws that you cannot obey them all. You stumble in one point, you, you break them all, according to James 2.10, you know, and that's why you need Jesus. Well, there's a lot of problems with that. And I want to just kind of, let's, let's talk about this just for a little bit. If you haven't encountered this, you will. First of all, the whole 613 thing, okay? It, it's very common, actually, especially in evangelical circles. There are 613 laws. Where do you get that from? I mean, let's, let's, let's be honest here. Where do you get that from? Because these people who quote this, you know, 613, 613, they're all uh, people who, oh, normally they're people who uh, are, you know, quote unquote, Bible believers. It's like it's sola scriptura. If it's in the Bible, we believe it. If it's not in the Bible, we don't believe it. Really? Okay. 613 is not in the Bible. Just for your information. FYI, 613 is not in the Bible. That number is not in the Bible. God did not enumerate his commandments. Okay. He did not enumerate his commandments at all. Somebody might say, well, he did in the Ten Commandments. Well, you know, I know this is a little bit of a rabbit trail, but in the original Hebrew, the word that's translated commandments, you know, when it comes to the quote unquote Ten Commandments, actually means words or sayings. It's more like a 10 point sermon. That's basically what it is. It doesn't really mean 10 commandments like enumerated to us. If you ask a Jew, right, Jewish people, they've grown up with this, they've studied this, they'll tell you there are 14 commandments in the 10 sayings, in the quote-unquote 10 commandments. There are actually 14 commandments. They break it down into 14. But the whole picture, you look at it from the whole picture, God never enumerated, God never counted his laws and said, okay, here's the amount of laws you need to obey. 613. In fact, the 613 number, that, that teaching is from the Talmud. A lot of Christians would be shocked to find out that this whole thing that they're riding on, this whole 613 thing that, you know, they, they parrot it like crazy, don't they? I mean, they go on about 613 laws that, you know, 600, you know, the Torah is 613 laws. Well, where do you get that from? Certainly not in the Bible. It's in the Torah. Yeah. Uh, by the way, uh, this is something that is kind of an interesting little tidbit as well. Uh, you know, I got to, you know, the Bible is not biblical. The Bible is unbiblical. But did you know that... The Christian Bible got its quote-unquote Old Testament from the Jews, okay? The quote-unquote Old Testament of the Christian Bible is actually the Tanakh in Jewish circles. And the Tanakh, the, the books that are in the, the canon of the Tanakh are actually, those books are actually expounded upon, listed in the Talmud as well, okay? So... Uh, just a little side note. Christians who say, I don't believe in the, oh no, you don't go by the Talmud at all. Nothing like, oh no, that's that's totally you know wrong. We don't go by the Talmud. Well, yeah, you'd, if you believe that the quote unquote Old Testament, that that is God's canon, then you are going by the Talmud because those books are listed in the Talmud as part of quote unquote uh, canon. If you believe there are 613 laws, you are going by the Talmud. In fact, you are cherry picking because you cherry pick. Oh, uh, 613. Oh, yeah. We, we can use this uh, for, uh, for our selling point, right? We can use this for a selling point. But everything else, well, not everything else, but 
a lot. They they totally reject from the Talmud, but they pick and choose what they like, right? They like the 613 law thing. By the way, if you go to Chabad.org, uh, you'll find that there are Jewish scholars who but who say that there are not 613 laws. They disagree with that. They've counted themselves, uh, they claim. Some believe it's less, some believe it's more. So the whole 613 law thing is the Talmud, number one. Number two, even amongst the Jewish community, even amongst Orthodox Jewish rabbis and scholars, there's no consensus on this 613 law thing. I mean, it's not believed right across. It's not like a fact. It's like, it's disputable. So that's two things. Number three, th- number three, I would say, is that even if it was 613 laws, okay, six, whatever it is, even if it's, even if it's only, you know, uh, 300 laws, 400 laws, 500 laws, they're not all for you. Just like if you... I don't know of anybody actually that actually studied the the law of the land, like uh, you know the country, state, or province, and county, and city that you're living in. I mean, how many people actually study the law? Like, okay, what laws are there that I need to obey? How many people actually do that? How many people actually read through the bylaws of their particular? town or city, county? How many people actually know all the laws of their state or even federal laws? How many people actually know that? Uh, I have heard, I cannot confirm this because quite, quite frankly, I'm not interested in counting all of them, but I've heard that in America alone, there are over 4 million laws. Over 4 million laws in America. And I would say that if you were to, uh, if you were to talk to most Christians in America today and ask them if they are law, if they are law-abiding citizens, most of them would probably say yes, they are. So what they're saying is that is that they are obeying all four million laws. That's what they're saying. If if they claim to be a law-abiding citizen, that's what they're saying. So these people, they obey the law of man more than the law of God. And they claim to be a child of God. Something wrong with the picture there. So the 613 laws, I guarantee, I mean, I don't know for sure, but I can pretty much, we pretty much know that we can assume, I say safely assume that this particular person probably has never studied the 613 laws, the, the you know, the uh, supposed 613 laws. They've never really actually got a list of the 613 laws. By the way, you can download it from the internet if you want to. This particular person probably never even looked through those laws, probably never even glanced at those laws. Because if they did, they would realize that those 613 laws are certainly not all applicable to the common man today. Most of them are for the Levitical priests, the priest, the priesthood, the, the temple uh, laws, and ceremonies and such. Most of them are for that, which means they're not for you or, 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 my, or myself. They're not for us. Some of those laws, some of those laws are for men only. Some of those laws are for women only. Some of those laws are for children only. Some of those laws are for farmers only. So, yeah, God has never, God never expects everyone to obey all all the laws any more than uh, the government today would expect you to obey the laws of flying a plane when you are riding a bicycle. No, if you're riding a bicycle, you should be following the the laws within your country, state, county, bylaws, whatever it is that you have to follow regarding riding a bicycle. You do not have to follow the laws of being of, of flying a plane. You don't have to start, you know, 
You don't have to, you don't have to uh, take off from the runway if you're riding a bicycle. You don't, have to, you don't have to communicate with air traffic controllers, okay? So, yeah. If you're walking down the street, you don't have to obey bus uh, laws for bus drivers. If you're in a car, you don't have to obey laws specifically for transport trucks. It's just, it's absurd to believe that we are supposed to obey all the laws because most of these laws are not even for us, okay? So even if it is, even if there are three, uh, 613 laws, most of them are not for us anyway. And let me just say this, that the ones that are for us are easy to obey, super easy to obey. They're not hard. If you think they're hard, you got a problem. Thou shalt not kill. Do you think that's hard? You know, if you think they're hard, you've got a problem. Deuteronomy, at the end of the giving of the law, okay, God says in Deuteronomy chapter 30, verse 11, now the commandment that I give, I'm giving today is not too difficult for you. Okay? God is not an unreasonable tyrant. Our wonderful heavenly father is not an abusive father to bark out commands at us that he knows that we can't obey and then punish us severely for not obeying the laws that we can't obey anyway just because he wants to show us how much of a sinner we are. Listen, if God wants us to know that we're sinners, he would just tell us. If he wants us to know that we're just a whole bunch of, you know, we're just a bunch of filthy, stinking, rotten sinners, he would tell us. He wouldn't throw, he wouldn't burden his people with hundreds of laws and horrible curses for not obeying these law, for those laws and leave them in that state for almost 1,500 years until the Messiah comes. No, that's not, that's not the Father. That's not God. So number one there, Yamaha guy, 19, we don't even know if there are 613 laws. Even the Jews are disputing about that. So I would highly recommend you stop with the 613 thing unless you really, you know, go with the whole Talmud and then, okay, if you do that, well, all the power to you. Follow all 613 laws? No, of course not because they're not all for us. Okay. By the way, you can still, I mean, if you do not follow all 613 laws, if there are 613, if you don't follow them all and you only follow the ones that are for, that are for you, that apply to you, you can, you can be still perfect in God's sight. You can be still, you you can still be without sin in God's sight because you have not transgressed the law. 1 John chapter uh, 3, verse 4, sin is the transgression of the law. So, if you don't obey the Levitical priest's laws because you're not a Levitical priest, then you haven't transgressed the law because it's not for you. It's not for you. So he says, I don't believe it. No one can. Yeah, well, no one can. Because, it, again, they're not all just like I don't think all all Americans or even any American that claims to be a law abiding citizen can obey all four million uh, laws of America because a lot of those laws are not pr applicable to them. Uh, Yamaha guy says it's why we need Jesus. Well, um. Jesus said, I don't come for the sinners, I come for the, or I don't come for the, the righteous, I come for the sinners to call them to repentance. He, he, he expressed his, his purpose. He, he made it very clear. This is what I'm here to do. I'm here to call the sinners to repentance. I'm here to heal the sinners. I'm, I'm a doctor to heal the sinners. There are righteous people. Sorry, Paul, but there are righteous people. It says, Luke chapter 1, verses 5 and 6, Zechariah and Elizabeth were both righteous. It says, 
obeying all, walking in all the commandments of the Lord blamelessly, they're righteous. In the next chapter, Luke chapter 2, you have Simeon. Simeon in the temple. It says he was righteous. Now, let me ask you a question there, Yamaha guy. If you were to go back to the first century and talk to Zechariah and Elizabeth, your Bible says that they were both righteous, walking in all, A-L-L, all the commandments and ordinances of the Lord blamelessly. Period. End of story. Can you, would you go back to them and tell them that they're sinners because they're not walking in all the commandments and ordinances of the Lord? Would you? Your Bible says they do walk in all the commandments and ordinances of the Lord blamelessly. They don't, they don't transgress. They are without blame because they don't transgress the law. Can you preach your, could you, you know, pitch your sales, you know, your selling points to Zechariah and Elizabeth about why they need Jesus because they can't uh, obey the commandments when they, they, they did obey the commandments? How can you, how can you, how can you pitch that to them? It doesn't apply to them. When Yeshua said, I don't come for the righteous, he was talking about those kind of people. I don't come for them. They don't need me. I come for the sinners. You think about it for a minute. This is what it says. Check it out. Luke chapter 1, verses 5 and 6. And Luke chapter 2 about Simeon. Some translations say Simeon was just. That word just in the Greek also means righteous. In fact, it's the same word that Paul used when he said there are none righteous. The same Greek word. So Luke chapter 2 says Simeon was righteous. Zechariah and Elizabeth were righteous. And Paul, using that same word, said there are none righteous. Okay? Going back here, you're claiming we can be perfect. Well, let me let me just let me just clarify this. Okay, uh, you you got a you got a good hint of that there, Yamaha guy. You got a good hint of it. It is possible to be perfect in the eyes of God. It is difficult to be perfect in the eyes of men. It's easy to be perfect in the eyes of God. It's difficult to be perfect in the eyes of men because God is more gracious than men are. God is more loving. He is more forgiving. He is easier to get along with, basically, than, than men are. Be, I mean, look at David when he sinned against the Lord and the prophet came to him and said, King David, the Lord has given you a choice. You know, it's either you, you, God will give you into the hands of men for punishment, or you can choose to be in the hands of God for punishment. You want punishment directly from God, or you want punishment from men? He said, I choose God because God is, is easier on me than men, will, than men are. The point is, is that human beings can be very picky. Uh, the past couple of days, I've noticed that people have been attacking me for, you know, some so, uh, some of the comments that I put in, put in over the years. Okay, even the old comments. Uh, you know, a lot of times this is what happens. Uh, and I'm super busy, and I run, to, you know, and I, and I check out, a, uh, you know, one of the comments, and I reply. You know, I'm, I'm doing it super fast, right? I'm replying super fast, and then I go and I do what I got to do. Sometimes I just reply super fast and just run, you know, and sometimes I, I make spelling mistakes. Sometimes there are typos. Sometimes I hit the wrong keys. Sometimes my fingers just don't, you know, you know, I mean, it all it happens to all, it happens to the best of us. Okay. And I've had, I've seen a, a couple people that have, that, that has attacked me viciously because I made a spelling mistake. I'm like, I'm sorry, I made a typo. Sometimes typos happen, you know. So the point is this. 
did I, am I perfect in their sight? No, I'm not. Is it, is it against their quote unquote law if I make a, if, if, if I make a spelling mistake? Well, apparently they hold me to it. They call me out on it, you know, and not, not, they're not very kind about it either. They're pretty, pretty nasty about it just because I make a typo. I sin in their eyes by doing that. It's a sin. But in the eyes of God, that's not a sin. There's nothing in the Torah that says, thou shalt spell, you know, thou shalt be a perfect speller when, when you, you know. There's nothing in the Torah that commands you to spell everything perfectly all the time. Apparently with human beings, there there is, some, at least some of them. So am I claiming we can be perfect? In the eyes of God, you can be. In the eyes of men, no. Well, some people, some people are kind and gracious. And yeah, some people, I mean, you can be, you can be perfect in the eyes of some people. They overlook a lot of things and they're, they're, they're gracious and they're good. And uh, they're not as difficult as other people are. So yeah. God's laws are easy to obey. And if you can obey them, and if you do obey them, which they're easy to obey, then you're perfect in his sight. However, if you are, um, you, know, you, 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 can, you can mess up in many other ways, not breaking God's laws, and that's not perfect in the eyes of men. So I'm not claiming that I can be perfect in your eyes, Yamaha guy, because apparently, I don't know if, you know, I'm not really even aiming for it, to be honest with you, but I'm not claiming I can be perfect in your eyes, but I will tell you that you can, you can be perfect in, in God's eyes. It's easy to obey the Torah. And once you do, you can fall in line with, with God's instructions. You'll be perfect. Yeshua said, be perfect. It's his commandment. Be perfect as your heavenly father is perfect. Is he, is he a tyrant it, to, to be barking out commands that you cannot obey? Again, this is abuse. If you cannot be perfect in the way that Yeshua commanded you to be perfect, then Yeshua is abusing you. He's, command, he's commanding you to do something you cannot do. That's not good. That's not a good leader. But if he commands you to do something that you can do, then the onus is on you. Then the ball is in your court. I submit to you, you can be perfect in the eyes of God. You can, you, 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 you can actually obey Jesus. Okay? You can actually obey Jesus. Okay, let's see what we have here. Thank you, by, uh, by the way, there, Yamaha guy. Thank you for the comment. Um, let me see what we have here in the live chat just before we get into the critical thinking tip. By the way, this is a little bit of a different tip, but it's a good one, a really good tip. Looking forward to this as well. As always, after the critical thinking tip, uh, we're going to have Hannah come and play for a few minutes. Tammy says, Shalom all. Shalom, Tammy. Welcome. Blessings. Blessings to you and yours. Billy says, Shalom. Shalom, Billy. Good to see you. Welcome. Voice of One. Hello from Canada. I love your shirts uh, so much. So much bought three today. Bought three today. I love your I love your search shirt so much. Bought three today. They are epic. Uh, peace be with you, brother. Thank you very much, uh, Voice of One. Enjoy the shirts. Yeah, thank you. Certainly, uh, you know, a shirt like this would. Uh, I know there's other ones too, uh, but a shirt like this can be a conversation piece. That's for sure, especially among amongst some Christians, for sure. Billy says, but if one kept all the laws of the United States, then they are done away with, right? (laughs) 
Kate says, Shalom, saints. Shalom, Kate. Welcome. Corey says, hello, Brother Chris. Hello, Corey. Good to see you. Jill says, not a jot or, or tittle. They believed in which was to come, the shadow pictures of what is yet to be. Here's a question for you, Joe. Uh, I know this is what it says in the in the gospel or in the uh, book of Hebrews. I know this is what it says, but let's just think for a minute about this. You go into the set, you go back to the first century. All they had was the Tanakh. They didn't have the New Testament. Okay, and even let's say the first century BC. First century AD, first century BC, whatever, doesn't matter. The New, the New Testament did not exist. All they had was the Tanakh, what we call the Old Testament. So did they know they were believing in the shadow? Did they know they were believing in the shadow? I will, I will say that there are some things in the Tanakh that are like shadows in that sense, okay? Okay. Uh, but when it comes to the Torah itself, it's his instructions for life, right? I mean, the uh, the Father gave us just, you know, great instructions. Thou shalt not steal. Thou shalt not bear false witness. These are, th those were all instructions for them to live, in, you know, good, peaceful lives. And God made it very clear. This is the reason why I'm giving you these commands is so, so that it will be, it will go well with you so that you will be blessed. He made it very clear. I don't know of any part of the Tanakh that clearly and explicitly tells them, Hey, by the way, guys, uh, these, this is the reason why I'm giving you all these commands just because it's just a shadow of what is to come. Think about that for a minute. Jill says, and I, and I do doubt that uh, they were on the Gregorian calendar or the Apostle Hillel too. Yeah, certainly we're not on the Gregorian calendar. Uh, come to think of it now, uh, in a couple days, I think it is on the Julian calendar. That's when the Orthodox people celebrate Christmas. Um, so that is their quote unquote, December 25th kind of thing in a, in a couple more days. Yeah. So yeah, they, it wouldn't be on the Gregorian calendar in that sense. However, um, the, apo the apostate, you said the apostate, did I say apostle? The apostate Hillel II. Um, I would like to, uh, I'm interested to know why you would call Hillel uh, an apostate. Because uh, I understand that Hillel was, uh, was the last great leader of the Sanhedrin, the judges of Israel. And uh, if you read Deuteronomy chapter 17, it tells us by the Torah, by God's word, if there are any things, any disputes, any, any matters of controversy... We are to go, we are to get our um, directions from the judges. If there's any problems, matters of controversy, we are to take that before the judges of Israel. And it says very clearly, we are to go by what they tell us. Go by what they tell us. So, um, I'm very interested in how and what you, what uh, evidence you have for uh, Hillel being an apostate. Okay. I'm just interested in that because as far as I have uh, seen and understand, he is the last judge of Israel, the official judge or, you know, the leader of the Sanhedrin as the last, pretty much like the chief justice of the Supreme Court, basically. And so according to the word of God, uh, 
according to the word of God, we're actually, we're actually supposed to go by the rulings of these judges. Notice it doesn't say figure it out for your, do it, you know, it doesn't say pray for yourself and God will speak to you. It doesn't say, you know, go and speak to the, uh, to your pastor or, you know, this kind of thing. It just, it says you are to go, you are to go by the rulings of the judges. Here's something here. Deuteronomy chapter 17, verse 8. If a matter arises which is too hard for you to judge, between degrees of guilt for bloodshed, between one judgment or another, or between one punishment or another, matters of controversy, this is it right here, matters of controversy within your gates, then you shall arise and go to the place which the Lord your God chooses, and you shall come to the priests, to the, Lev or the Levites, to the judge in those days, and inquire of them. They shall pronounce upon you the sentence of judgment. You shall do according to the sentence which they pronounce upon you in the place, in that place which the Lord chooses. And you shall be careful to do according to all that they order you, according to the sentence of the law in which they instruct you, according to the judgment which they tell you, you shall do. You shall not turn aside to the right hand or to the left from, that, from the sentence which they pronounce upon you. Okay? So, According to that, um, we are to go by the rulings of the, the judge, okay, the judges. And Hillel was the last great judge of the Sanhedrin. Uh, he made some rulings that, now, according to the Torah, these rulings are rulings that, especially when it comes to the calendar, these rulings are rulings we're supposed to go by. It doesn't say, go and figure it out yourself. That's not what it says. It says, Go to the judge and, and be careful to do what the judge tells you to do. Thank you. Thank you, Jill. Corey says, um, these people are judging unrighteously, disguising themselves as righteous people. If these are Christians attacking you, they worship the devil and are common Trinitarians. You know, I, I get a lot of people, you know, people who say, commanding me not to judge, you know, do not judge. Thou shalt not judge. Bible says don't judge. I'm like, well, don't judge me for judging you. <laughs> you know, don't judge me for being, uh, don't judge me for being judgmental. <laughs> okay. Psalm says, or Psalm ninety four says, "What if the just, the judge, is unjust?" Well, in this in this particular case, now let me let me ask you a question: What judge, what what judge in history that that was appointed as the leader of the Sanhedrin? Which one was unjust? Okay, which one was unjust and why were they un explain how they could be unjust?
think the idea is, is that we're supposed to, uh, you know, that God is, is in control of, uh, at least was in the control of the Sanhedrin, at least generally speaking, okay? Jill says the Messiah is the high priest, not Hillel too. Who said that Hillel too was the high priest? I certainly didn't. I'm wondering who you're arguing against there, Jill. If you're arguing against me, then that's a straw man because that's not what that's not representing what I said. I said hello too. It was the last great judge, and according to Deuteronomy 17, you are supposed to go by that judge. Joe says the temple was no more that again, the, I'm not sure what your argument is all about because this has nothing to do with the temple. Um, it doesn't say in Deuteronomy 17, you know, as long as the temple stands, you're supposed to go to the judges. If not, then just do your own thing or pray or, you know, that's not what it says. Um, It's really got nothing to do with the temple. And let me just add as well, Hillel too knew that the temple will, everything's going to be destroyed anyway. That's why he made the final judgments that he did in order for them to be put in effect and permanent until the temple, you know, until further notice. And we're still on that further notice. So those judgments would still be in, in place. Jill, you made another claim here. You, you said he denied the Messiah. Could you, could you give me evidence for that? Because I have evidence against that. According to Epiphanius of Salma, Salamis, okay, there's a, a writing, uh, a document that he wrote, uh, the, um, and uh, we find it in the, what is it called, Pan, Panarian of Epis, Epiphanius of Salmius, book one, and it talks about Hillel, and talks about the last days of Hillel. Now, it, it, it doesn't call, it, it's not spelt the same. It's E-L-L-E-L. -E -L. This is Hillel, by the way. It's just another way of, of spelling it, okay? This is it's talking about Hillel too here, okay? Now, the patriarch at that time was, Hel, was Hillel. Or this would be Hillel too, Hillel. Right. You know, I mean, check it check it out. Trust me, this is, this is Hillel too. You check, you check it out in, in the history, in, in the time that uh, Epiphanius is talking about. Uh, it says, I think that was how Josephus pronounced his name, unless I am mistaken because of the time he was descended from Gamaliel. Okay, yeah, so Hillel too was, a, was descended from Gamaliel, uh, who had been one of their patriarchs. One may suspect, and others have suggested this as well, that these patriarchs were descended from the first Gamaliel, the Savior's contemporary who gave godly counsel of refraining from abuse of the apostles. Yes, see, even Gamaliel, being the judge of the Sanhedrin in, in the book of Acts, said, do not persecute the Christians. It's not, it's not, you know, so he gave a judgment there that Paul should have obeyed, although he didn't. You know, he didn't obey the judgment of, uh, of, uh, the, of Gamaliel at the time. When Hillel, again, this is Hillel too, when he was dying, he asked for the bishop who then lived near Tiberias and received holy baptism from him. Huh? Yeah. Hillel too asked for the bishop from Tiberias to come and baptize him before he died. So, Jill, where, where's, your, uh, where's your evidence for this? He denied the Messiah. Where is that? And if he did, 
if he did, because I don't see any evidence of it, but if he did, obviously, according to Epiphanius, he repented and quote unquote got saved at the last minute. At least it just says, okay, be more accurate. It says what I just read. He called for the bishop and he had the bishop to baptize him. What does that tell you? Do you have any evidence for that, uh, Jill? If you do, let me know where that evidence is. If I don't see any evidence, then I'm just going to file that as, okay, you're just saying it, but there's no evidence to it. Psalm 94 says, I was, I was referring to the judges today. Okay, well, yeah, uh, that's that's a totally, um, yeah, that's, that's like another whole topic of the, uh, uh, we're talking about the judges according to the Torah, the judges of the Torah, uh, which are the Sanhedrin. Okay, the Sanhedrin is the Jewish court uh, consisting of seventy judges, and it's actually it, it actually was put in place by Moses himself uh, back in the day in his days, and, and we read about that in the Torah. And it was in place up until Hillel too. And he was the last one to, uh, to, he was the last great leader of the Sanhedrin. Moses was the first. Hillel too was the last. Corey says, if Jesus Christ Melchizedek, does this mean the priesthood is no more? Uh, no. Okay. Okay. So, um, first of all, we, we actually, uh, we've done a, several different videos on Melchizedek. Okay. So it's commonly believed, uh, that Melchizedek was a, a human being that, uh, was the King of Salem at that time, uh, the King of the ancient city of Jerusalem. Uh, and, uh, Hillel, uh, Hillel one and Hillel two were not priests. Okay. So they're not priests. They are, uh, or they were uh, judges of the Sanhedrin. So they're two totally different, um, branches, I guess you would say these. So, uh, you wouldn't put Hillel two in the, in the category of priest. Jill, I'm I'm not going to respond too much to much of this because much of this stuff is is completely against all of the historical evidence that we've ever known. The Sanhedrin was destroyed the day of the crucifixion. Again, where you get this evidence from? Because Hillel is the Hillel too. He's the one who uh, who put in, especially when it comes to the, the calendar, he's the one that said, he knew that the Romans would come and basically strip the Sanhedrin and, and, and just, and wipe out all of that, you know, wipe out the, uh, uh, the hierarchy, the structure of that. And, uh, he put in place what he put in place because he saw that coming. Um, yeah, there's so much against what you're saying, Jill. I cannot, I, there's no way I, I'm, I'm not going to be speaking too much to this anymore because we see that the Sanhedrin was still in effect in the book of Acts because Gamaliel was the leader of the Sanhedrin. You know, he was, he was one of the great judges. Again, it's like the, uh, like the, like the chief justice of the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court being as the Sanhedrin. Corey says, is, is he Melchizedek? It seems to me that Melchizedek was a real human being and not just not a pre-incarnate per se. It seems to me that Melchizedek was a real human being, the king of Salem. It was actually a, a king of the uh, the city, the ancient city of Jerusalem back in the day. 
Uh, again, we've made uh, several videos on that whole topic. So, uh, Corey, I, I would recommend, uh, please go watch those videos. We, we, spent, we dedicated entire videos to that. Jill says, uh, sorry, I'm only catching part of this. Uh, my phone won't quit buffering. Okay. All right. Thank you for letting us know, Jill. Zaria says, what do you think of Jesus? He's awesome. He's awesome. Okay. Uh, let's, let's, um, I'm going to, let's talk about the critical thinking tip of the day. Then we'll get Hannah on. And, uh, and then we'll get into the pseudo, the pseudo gospel or the gospel of pseudo Matthew, excuse me, the, the gospel of pseudo Matthew, another interesting uh, part of the kind of like the infancy gospel series. Okay. So critical thinking tip of the day. Now this is, this is kind of a simple one, but it is, it can be quite profound. And so I don't have a, a particular slide for this, but here it is. Critical thinking tip of the day. Practice active listening. Practice active listening. One of the major ingredients, uh, one of the major uh, components of good critical thinking is first to be a good listener. If you can listen to the case, the, uh, if you can listen to the argument that's being presented, the claims that are being made, you can, it, it will help you to gather the information that's needed to, to think critically. And, you know, we cannot really even be good, um, good, excuse me, good critical thinkers without having a good, uh, without having the skill of listening. We must be able to listen and, and process the information we're getting. A lot of people, I think that some people, <laughs> a lot, too many people, um, need, need more of this skill. Okay. To, to listen to what's being said and to what's being communicated, not even, not, 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 not just what's being said, but what's being communicated because sometimes, you know, what's being communicated is not necessarily limited to words. So how do you listen how do you become a good listener? How do you practice, practice active listening? It starts number one in the heart, right? it starts with your attitude. It starts with being humble and unassuming, connecting with the person that's communicating with you. Not always wanting to speak, but wanting to listen. Understanding the value of listening. You know, understand the value of listening. So once we know how valuable it is, how much we need to listen, and we humble ourselves and just listen, that's like the first, the first step of good critical thinking skills because many times people, they, they assume they, they jump the gun. They assume what is being spoken. They assume things that are not, they assume that someone is saying something that they're not. Okay. So, I mean, that's really that's really where it's at. Taking the time, making the time to listen, to hear 
to hear somebody else out. A lot of times when people are communicating, they're not listening. All they're doing is just, it's like a monologue. You know, they're, they're talking over you. You know, they want to get their point out, point across. But part of that is, is, is part of the skills of good critical thinking is to listen. To listen. So I pray that every one of you would be blessed abundantly with humility and the ability to listen. The ability to listen. A lot of times we jump to conclusions. We, we speak before we, we've heard the whole story. Like, like how it says in Proverbs. Let me just go there quickly. Proverbs 18, verse 13. Proverbs 18, verse 13. He who answers a matter before he hears it, it is folly and a shame to him. So good critical thinking is to use good wisdom. Not to practice folly, not to be shameful in the way that, you know, we uh, we behave but re- or in our actions. And part of that is is really to hear, to listen, to hear out the other side. To hear out the other side. Hear them out. And then answer. Okay. So that will be our critical thinking tip of the day. So Hannah's going to come here and she is going to play for us. And, uh, and after this, we are going to get into the gospel of Pseudo Matthew. Hannah, go ahead.
Well, thank you, Hannah, as always. Thank you for blessing us with your talent. Blessings, blessings multiplied to you. That was beautiful. Okay, so uh, we are going to be reading from the Gospel of Pseudo-Matthew. Now, this particular gospel has quite a history to it, and so uh, I'm just going to quickly just briefly go over it. Uh, it, uh, it claims to be that which was uh, translated by Jerome, a.k.a. St. Jerome, and that would have been in the early centuries. And um, it was it claims to be translated from Hebrew, okay, into Latin. And it, it, it deals with the, uh, the, the story of the birth of Mary, the mother of Yeshua, and uh, Yeshua himself all the way up until he's uh, uh, pretty much a teenager. And, um, and so the scholars, they believe that it's, it's actually, it has been added to over time. Uh, it, it wasn't all just written at once. And, uh, and so it's kind of like a, an, it's another one of these gospels that are kind of like a, a compilation of different, uh, different works concerning the life of Mary and that. Now, some, some scholars believe that it, it dates, uh, as late as 800 AD, whereas, uh, parts of it, they say go, uh, back to, uh, the fifth century or the uh, sixth century and seventh century. So it is an earlier work. Uh, and uh, a lot of it that uh, a lot of the uh, this particular gospel is uh, um, is a repeat of what the other gospels have already said in regards to the uh, the infancy of Yeshua. How, however, there are some things that are uh, p- uh, particular um, uh, exclusive to this gospel. And so this is, uh, this is the reason why we're reading it. So there are some things in here that we won't find in other ones. However, a, a lot of it is uh, kind of like a rehashing of what we've already been reading the past few days. Okay, so uh, let's get into this. This will be uh, f- read from uh, newadvent.org. Uh, you can read it from several different sources. In fact, I'm just choosing this as a good format and... Uh, the, the font and everything is 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 not too not too hard to read. So this is the Gospel of Pseudo Matthew, uh, and it's also known as the Infancy Gospel of Matthew, and uh, it's also called the Book about the Origin of the Blessed Mary and the Childhood of the Savior. So there's a few different titles for this book. All right. Here begins the book of the birth of the Blessed Mary and the infant infancy of the Savior. Written in Hebrew by the Blessed Evangelist Matthew and translated into Latin by the Blessed Presbyter Jerome. To their well-beloved brother Jerome, the presbyter, bishops Chromatius and Heliodorus in the Lord greeting the birth of the Virgin Mary and the nativity of and infancy of our Lord Jesus Christ we find in apocryphal books. But considering that in them many things contrary to our faith are written, we have believed that they ought all to be rejected, lest perchance we should transfer the joy of Christ to Antichrist. While, therefore, we were considering these things, there came holy men, Parmenius and Varinus, who said that your holiness had found a Hebrew volume written by the hand of the most blessed evangelist Matthew in which also the virgin or excuse me the birth of the virgin mother herself and the infancy of our savior were written and accordingly we entreat your affection by our lord jesus christ himself to render it from the hebrew into latin not so much for the attainment of those things 
which are the insignia of Christ. As for the exclusion of the craft of heretics, who, in order to teach bad doctrine, have mingled their own lies with the excellence, the excellent nativity of Christ, that by the sweetness of life they might hide the bitterness of death. It will, therefore, become your purest piety either to listen to us as your brethren in treating or to let us have as bishops exacting the debt of affection which you may, which you may deem due. Repi- reply to the letter by, Jer- by Jerome. To my lords, the holy and most blessed bishops, Chrom, uh, Chromos, Chromatius and Heliodorus, Jerome, a humble servant of Christ in the Lord, greeting. He who digs in ground where, where he knows that there is gold does not instantly snatch at whatever the uptorn trench may pour forth, but before the stroke of the quivering spade raises aloft the the glittering mass, he meanwhile lingers over the sod to turn them over and lift them up, and especially he has not added to his gains. An arduous task, excuse me, an arduous task is enjoined upon me, since what your blessedness has commanded me, the holy apostle and evangelist Matthew himself did not write for the purpose of publishing. For if he had not done it somewhat secretly, he would have added it also to his gospel, which he published. But he composed this book in Hebrew, and so little did he, pu- did he publish it, that at this day the book written in Hebrew by his own hand, is in the possession of very religious men, to whom in successive periods of time it has been handed down by those that were before them. And this book they never at any time gave to anyone to translate. And so it came to pass that when it was published by a disciple of Manichaeus named Lucius, who also wrote the, the falsely styled Acts of the Apostles, I guess this would be Luke, Luke, Lucas, who also wrote the falsely styled Acts of the Apostles, this book afforded matter not of edification, but of perdition, and the opinion of the Synod in regard to it was according to its deserts that the ears of the church should not be open to it. Let the snapping of those that bark against us now cease, for we do not add this little book to the canonical writings, but we translate that which was written by the apostle and evangelist that we may disclose the falsehood of heresy. In this work, then, we obey the commands of pious bishops as well as oppose impious impious heretics. It is the love of Christ, therefore, which we fulfill, believing that they will assist us by their prayers, who through obedience attain to a knowledge of the holy infancy of our Savior. There is extant another letter, to the same bishops attributed to Jerome. You ask me to let you know what I think of a book held by some to be about the nativity of St. Mary. And so I wish to know that there is much in it that is false. For one, Seleucus, who wrote the sufferings of the apostles, composed this book, but just as he just as he wrote what was true about their powers and the miracles they worked, but said a great deal 
that was a, that was false about their doctrine so here too he has invented many untruths out of his own head i shall take care to render it word for word exactly as it is written in the hebrew since it is asserted that it was composed by the holy evangelist matthew and written in hebrew and set at the head of his gospel. Whether this be true or not, I leave to the author of, of the preface and the trustworthiness of the writer. As for myself, I pronounce them doubtful. I do not affirm that they are clearly false. But this I say freely, and I think none of the faithful will deny it, that whether these stories be true or inventions, the sacred nativity of St. Mary was preceded by great miracles and succeeded by the greatest. And so by, by those who believe that God can do these things, they, they can be believed and read without damaging their faith or imperiling their souls. In short, so far as I can, following the sense rather than the words of the writer, I sometimes walking, excuse me, and sometimes walking in the same path, though not in the same footsteps, sometimes digressing a little, but still keeping the same road. I shall in this way keep the, by the style of the narrative and shall say nothing that is not either written there or might, following the same train of thought, have been written. Chapter 1 In those days there was a man in Jerusalem, Joachim by name, of the tribe of Judah. He was the shepherd of his own sheep fearing the Lord in integrity and singleness of heart. He had no other care than that of his herds, from the produce of which he supplied with food all that feared God, offering double gifts in the fear of God to all who labored in doctrine and who ministered unto him. Therefore, his lambs and his sheep and his wool and all things whatsoever he prospered, he possessed. He, he used to divide into three portions. One he gave to the orphans, the widows, the strangers, and the poor. The second to those that worship God. And the third he kept for himself and all his house. And as he did so, the Lord multiplied to him his herds so that there was no man like him in the people of Israel. This now he began to do when he was 15 years old. And at the age of 20, he took to wife Anna, the daughter of Akar, of, the, of his own tribe, that is the tribe of Judah, of the family of David. And though they had lived together for 20 years, he had by her neither sons nor daughters. Chapter 2 And it happened that in the time of the feast, among those who were offering incense to the Lord, Joachim stood getting ready his gifts in the sight of the Lord, and the priest, Reuben by name, coming to him, said, It is not lawful for you to stand among those who are doing sacrifice to God, because God has not blessed you so as to give you seed in Israel. Being therefore put to shame in the sight of the people, he retired from the temple of the Lord weeping, and did not return to his house, but went to his flocks, taking with him his shepherds into the mountains to a far country, so that for five months his wife Anna could hear no tidings of him. And she prayed with tears, saying, O Lord, most mighty God of Israel, why have you 
seeing that already you have not given me children, taken from me my husband also. Behold, now five months that I have not seen my husband, and I know not where he, what, where he is tarrying, nor if I knew if I knew him to be dead, I could bury him. And while she wept excessively, she entered into the court of his house, and she fell on her face in prayer and poured out her supplications before the Lord. After this, rising from her prayer and lifting her eyes to God, she saw a sparrow's nest in a laurel tree and uttered her voice to the Lord with groaning and said, Lord God Almighty, who has given offspring to every creature, to, wild, to beasts wild and tame, to serpents and birds and fishes, and, all that re- and they all rejoice over their young ones. You have shut out me alone from the gift of your benignity. For you, O God, know my heart that from the beginning of my married life, I have vowed that if you, O God, should give me a son or daughter, I would offer them to you in your holy temple. And while she was thus speaking, suddenly an angel of the Lord appeared before her, saying, Be not afraid, Anna, for there is seed for you in the decree of God. And all generations, even to the end, shall wonder at that which shall be born of you. And when he had thus spoken, he vanished out of her sight. But she, in fear and dread, because she had seen such a sight, and heard such words, at length went into her bedchamber and threw herself on the bed as if dead. And for a whole day and night she remained in in great trembling and in prayer. And after these things she she called to her, her servant, and said to her, Do you see me deceived in my widowhood and in great perplexity? And have... Have you been unwilling to come in to, uh, to, to me? Then she, with a slight murmur, thus answered and said, If God has shut up your womb and has taken away your husband from you, what can I do for you? And when Anna heard this, she lifted up her voice and wept aloud. Chapter 3 At the same time, there appeared a young man on the mountains to Joachim while he was feeding his flocks and said to him, Why do you not return to your wife? And Joachim said, I have heard her. I have heard her for 20 years. Excuse me. I, I have had her for 20 years and it has not been the will of God to give me children by her. I have been driven with shame and reproach from the temple of the the Lord. Why should I go back to her when I have been once cast off and utterly despised? Here then will I remain with my sheep. And so long as in this life God is willing to grant me light, I shall willingly by the hands of my servants bestow their portions upon the poor and the orphans, and those that fear God. And when he had thus spoken, the young man said to him, I am an angel of the Lord, and I have today appeared to your wife when she was weeping and praying, and have consoled her. And know that she, she has conceived a daughter from your seed, and you, shall, and you, in your ignorance of this, has left her. She will be in the temple of God, and the Holy Spirit shall abide in her, and her blessedness shall be greater than than that of all the holy women, so that no one can say that any before her has been like her, or that any after her in this world will be so. Therefore, go down from the mountains and return to your wife, whom you will find with child. For God has raised up seed in her, 
and for this you will give God thanks. And her seed shall be blessed, and she herself shall be blessed, and shall be made the mother of eternal blessing. Then Joachim adored the angel and said to him, If I have found favor in your sight, sit for a little while in my tent and bless your servant. And the angel said to him, Do not say servant, but fellow servant, for we are the servants of one master. But my food is invisible, and my drink cannot be seen by a mortal. Therefore you ought not to ask me to enter your tent. But if you were about to give me anything, offer it as a burnt offering to the Lord. Then Joachim took a lamb without spot and said to the angel, I should not have dared to offer a burnt offering to the Lord unless your command had given me the priest's right, right of offering. And the angel said to him, I should not have invited you to offer unless I had known the will of the Lord. And when Joachim was offering the sacrifice to God, the angel and the odor of the service went, or excuse me, the odor of the sacrifice went together straight up to heaven with the smoke. Then Joachim, throwing himself on his face, lay in prayer from the sixth hour of the day even until evening. And his lads and hired servants were with him that, or who were with him, saw him, and not knowing why he was lying down, thought that he was dead. And they came to him and with difficulty raised him from the ground. And when he recounted to them the vision of the angel, they were struck with great fear and wonder and advised him to accomplish the vision of the angel without delay and to go back with all haste to his wife. And when Joachim was turning over in his mind whether whether he should go back or not, it happened that he was overpowered by a deep sleep. And behold, the angel who had already appeared to him when awake appeared to him in his sleep, saying, I am the angel appointed by God as your guardian. Go down with confidence and return to Anna, because the deeds of mercy which you and your wife, Anna, have done, have been told in the presence of the Most High. And to you will God give such fruit as no prophet or saint has ever had from the beginning or ever will have. And when Joachim awoke out of his sleep, he called all his herdsmen to him and told them his dream. And they worshiped the Lord and said to him, See that you you further despise excuse me, see that you, you that you no further despise the words of the angel, but rise and let let us go hence and return to a quiet place feeding our our, fo- our flocks. Return and return at a quiet pace re, uh, re- feeding our flocks. And when, after 30 days occupied in going back, they were now near at hand. Behold, the angel of the Lord appeared to Anna, who was standing and praying, and said, Go to the gate, which is called Golden, and meet your husband in the way, for today he will come to you. She, therefore, went towards him in haste with her maidens, and praying to the Lord, she stood a long time in the gate, waiting for him. And when she was wearied with long waiting, she lifted up her eyes and saw Joachim afar off coming with his flocks. And she ran to him and hung around his neck and hung on his neck, giving thanks to God and saying, I was a widow and behold, now I am not so. I was barren and behold, I have now conceived. And so they worshiped the Lord and went into their, their own house. And when this was heard of, 
there was great joy among all their neighbors and acquaintances, so that the whole land of Israel congratulated them. Chapter 4 After these things, her nine months being fulfilled, Anna brought forth a daughter and called her Mary. And having weaned her in her third year, Joachim and Anna his wife went together to the temple of the Lord to offer sacrifices to God and place the infant, Mary by name, in the community of virgins in which the virgins remained day and night praising God. And when she was put down before the doors of the temple, she went up the fifth 15 steps so swiftly that she did not look back at all, nor did she, as children are wont, are wont to do, seek for her parents. Whereupon her parents, each of them anx- anxiously seeking for the child, were both alike astonished until they found her in the temple, and the priests of the temple themselves wondered. Chapter 5 Then Anna, filled with the Holy Spirit, said before them all, The Lord Almighty, the God of hosts, being mindful of his word, has visited his people with a good and holy visitation to bring down the hearts of the Gentiles who were rising against us and turn them to himself. He has opened his ears to our prayers. He has kept away from us the exalting of all our enemies. The barren has become a mother and has brought forth exaltation and and gladness to Israel. Before the gifts which I have brought to offer to, to my Lord and my enemies have not been able to hinder me, for God has turned their hearts to me and himself has given me everlasting joy. Chapter 6. And Mary was held in admiration by all the people of Israel. And when she was three years old, she walked with a step so mature, she spoke so perfectly, and spent her time so assiduously in the praises of God that all were astonished at her and wondered. And she was not reckoned a young infant, but as it were a grown-up person of thirty years old. She was so constant in prayer, and her appearance was so beautiful and glorious that sacredly that scarcely, I should say, that scarcely anyone could look into her face. And she occupied herself constantly with her woe work, so that she in her tender years could do all that all that old women were, a, were not able to do. And this was the order that she had set for herself. From the morning to the third hour, she remained in prayer. From the third to to the ninth, she was occupied with her weaving. From the ninth, she again applied herself to prayer. She did not retire from praying until there appeared to her the angel of the Lord, from from whose hand she used to receive food. And thus she became more and more perfect in the work of God. Then, when the older virgins rested from the praises of God, she did not rest at all, so that in the praises and vigils of God none were found before her, no one more learned in the wisdom of the law of God, more lowly in humility, more elegant in singing, more perfect in all virtue. She was indeed steadfast, immovable, unchangeable, and the daily advancing and daily advancing to perfection. No one saw her angry, nor heard her speaking evil. All her speech was so full of grace that her God was acknowledged to be in her tongue. She was always engaged in prayer and in searching the law. And she was anxious lest by any word of hers she uh, she should sin with regard to her companions. 
Then she was afraid lest in her laughter or the sound of her beautiful voice, she should commit any fault or lest being elated, she should display any wrongdoing or haughtiness to one of her equals. She blessed God without intermission and lest perchance even in her salutation, she might cease from from praising God. If anyone saluted her, she used to answer by, by way of salutation, thanks be to God. And from her and from her the custom first began of men saying thanks be to God when they saluted each other. She refreshed herself only with the food which she daily received from the hand of the angel. But the food which she obtained from the priest she divided among the poor. The angels of God were often seen speaking with her, and they most diligently obeyed her. If anyone who what if anyone who was unwell touched her, this the same hour he went home cured. Chapter seven. Then Abiathar the priest offered gifts without end to the to the high priest in order that he might obtain her as a wife to his to his son. But Mary forbid forbade them, saying, I cannot be that I should know a man. It cannot be that I should know a man, or that a man should know me. For all the priests and all her relations kept saying to her, God is worshipped in children and adored in posterity, as has always happened from the sons of Israel, among the sons of Israel. But Mary answered and said to them, God is worshipped in chastity, as is proved first of all. For before Abel, there was none righteous among men, and he by his offerings pleased God, and was without mercy slain by him who displeased him. Two crowns, therefore, he received, of oblation and of virginity, because in his flesh there was no pollution. Elijah also, when he was in the flesh, was taken up in the flesh, because he kept his flesh unspotted. Now I, from my infancy in the temple of God, have learned that virginity can be sufficiently dear to God. And so, because I can offer what is dear to God, I have resolved in my heart that I should not know a man at all. Chapter 8 Now it came to pass... When she was fourteen years old, and on this account there was occasion for the Pharisees saying that it was now a custom that no woman of that age should abide in the temple of God, they fell upon the plan of sending a herald through all the tribes of Israel that on the third day all should come together into the temple of the Lord. And when all the people had come together, Abiathar the high priest arose and mounted on a higher step that he might be seen and heard by all the people. And when great silence had been obtained, he said, Hear me, O sons of Israel, and receive my words into your ears. Ever since this temple was built by Solomon, there have been in it virgins, the daughters of kings and the daughters of prophets, and of high priests and priests, and they were great and worthy of admiration. But when they came to the proper age, they were given in marriage and followed the course of their mothers before them and were pleasing to God. But a new order of life has been found out by Mary alone, who promises that she will remain a virgin to God. Wherefore, it seemed to me that through our iniquity and the answer of God, we should try to ascertain 
to, to whose keeping she ought to be entrusted. When these words found favor with all the synagogue, excuse me, then these words found favor with all the synagogue. And the lot was cast by the priests upon the twelve tribes, and the lot fell upon the tribe of Judah. And the priest said, Tomorrow let everyone who has no wife come and bring his rod in his hand. Whence it happened that Joseph brought his rod along with the young men. And the rods, having been handed over to the high priest, he offered a sacrifice to the Lord God and inquired of the Lord. And the Lord said to him, Put all their rods into the holy of holies of God, and let them remain there, and order them to come to you on the morrow to get back their rods. And the man from the point of whose rod a dove shall come forth and fly towards heaven and in whose hand the rod when given back shall ex- ex- exhibit this sign to him let Mary be delivered f- to be kept. On the following day then all having assembled early and an incense offering have been made the high priest went into the holy of holies and brought forth the rods. And when he had distributed the rods, and the dove came forth out of none of them, the high priest put on the twelve bells and the uh, sacerdotal robe, and entering into the holy of holies, he there made a burnt offering and poured forth a prayer. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him, saying, There is there is here the shortest rod, of which you have made no account. You brought it in the you brought it in with the rest, but it did not take but did not take it out with them. When you have taken it out and have given it him whose it is, In it will appear the sign of which I spoke to you. Now that was Joseph's rod. And because he was an old man, he had been cast off, as it were, that he might not receive her. But neither did he himself wish to ask back his rod. And when when he was humbly standing last of all, The high priest cried out to him with a loud voice, saying, Come, Joseph, and receive your rod, for we are waiting for you. And Joseph came up trembling, because the high priest had called him with a very loud voice. But as soon as he stretched forth his hand and laid hold of his rod, immediately from the top of it came forth a dove whiter than snow, beautiful exceedingly, which after long flying about the the roofs of the temple, at length flew towards the heavens. Then all the people congratulated the old man, saying, You have been made blessed in your old age, O Father Joseph, seeing that God has shown you to be fit to receive Mary. And the priests, having said to him, Take her, because Of all the tribe of Judah, you alone have been chosen by God. Joseph began bashfully to address them, saying, I am an old man and have children. Why do you hand over to me me this infant, who is younger than my grandsons? Then Abiathar, the high priest, said to him, Remember, Joseph, how Dathan and Abiron and Korah perished because they despise the will of God. So will it happen to you if you despise this which is commanded you by God. Joseph answered him, I indeed do not despise the will of God, but I shall be her guardian until I can ascertain concerning the will of God. As to which of my sons can have her as as his wife? Let some virgins of of her companions, with whom she may meanwhile spend her time, 
be given for a consolation to her? Abiathar the high priest answered and said, Five virgins indeed shall be given her for consolation until the appointed day come in which you you may receive her. For to no other can she be joined in marriage. Then Joseph received Mary with the five with the other five virgins who uh, who were to be with her in Joseph's house. These virgins were Rebecca, Sephora, Susanna, Ab- Abigail, and Kael. To whom the high priest gave the silk and the blue and the fine linen and the scarlet and the purple and the fine flax. For they cast lots among themselves what each virgin should do. And the purple for the, for the veil of the temple of the Lord fell to the lot of Mary. And when she had got it, those virgins said to her, Since you, at, since you are the last and humble and younger than, than all, you have deserved to receive and obtain the purple. And thus saying, as it were in words of annoyance, they began to call her queen of virgins. While, however, uh, they were they were so doing, the angel of the Lord appeared in the midst of them, saying, "These words shall not have been shall not have been uttered by way of annoyance, but prophesied as as a prophecy most true." They trembled, therefore, at the sight of the angel and at his words, and asked her to pardon them and pray for them. Chapter 9 And on the second day, while Mary was at the fountain to fill her pitcher, the angel of the Lord appeared to her, saying, Blessed are you, Mary, for in your womb you have prepared a habitation for the Lord. For lo, the light from heaven shall come and dwell in you, and shall and by means of you will shine over the whole world. Again, on the third day, while she was working at the purple with her fingers, there entered a young man of ineffable beauty. And when Mary saw him, she exceedingly feared and trembled. And he said to her, Hail, Mary, full of grace. The Lord is with you. Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. And when she heard these words, she trembled and was exceedingly afraid. And the angel of the Lord added, Fear not, Mary, for you have found favor with God. Behold, you shall conceive in your womb and shall bring forth a king who fills not only the earth but the heaven and who reigns from generation to generation. Chapter 10. While these things were doing, Joseph was occupied with his work house building in the districts by the seashore, for he was a carpenter. And after nine months, he came back to his house and found Mary pregnant. Wherefore, being in the utmost distress, he trembled and cried out, saying, O Lord God, receive my spirit, for it is better for me to die than to live any longer. And the virgins who were with Mary said to him, Joseph, why are you, what are you saying? We know that no man has touched her. We can testify that she is still a virgin and untouched. We have watched over her. Always has she continued with us in prayer. Daily daily do the, the, uh, the angels of God speak with her. Daily does she receive food from the hand of the Lord. We know not how it is possible that there can be any sin in her. But if you wish us to tell you what what we suspect, nobody but the angel of the Lord has made her pregnant. Excuse me. Then said Joseph, Why did you mislead me to believe that an angel of the Lord has made her pregnant? But it is possible that some that someone has pretended to be an angel of the Lord and has beguiled her. And thus speaking, he wept and said, 
with what face shall I look at the temple of the Lord or with what face shall I see the priests of God? What am I to do? And thus saying, he thought that he would flee and send her away. Chapter 11. And when he was thinking of rising up and hiding himself and dwelling in secret, behold, on that very night, the angel of the Lord appeared to him in sleep, saying, Joseph, you son of David, fear not, receive Mary as your wife, for that which is in her womb is of the Holy Spirit, and she shall bring forth a son and call, and his name shall be called Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. And Joseph rising from his sleep, gave thanks to God and spoke to Mary and the virgins who were with her and told them his vision. And he was comforted about about Mary, saying, I have sinned in that I suspected you all. Excuse me. In that I suspected you at all. Chapter 12. After these things, there arose a great report that Mary was with child. And Joseph was seized by the officers of the temple and brought along Mary, uh, with Mary to the high priest. And he, with the priest, began to reproach him and, and to say, Why have you beguiled so great and so glorious a virgin who was fed like a dove in the temple by the hands of God, or excuse me, by the angels of God? who never wished either to see or to have a man who had the the most excellent knowledge of the law of God. If you had not done violence to her, she would still have remained in her virginity. And Joseph vowed and swore that he had never touched her at all. And Abiathar the high priest answered him, As the Lord lives... I will give you to drink of the water of drinking of the Lord, and immediately your sin will appear. Then was assembled a great multitude of people which could not be numbered, and Mary was brought to the temple. And the priests and her relatives and her parents wept and said to Mary, Confess to the priests your sin. You that was like a dove in the temple of God and received food from the hands of an angel, and again, Joseph was summoned to, summoned to the altar, and the water of drinking of the Lord was given him to drink. And when anyone that had lied drank this water and walked seven times round the altar, God used to show some sign in his face. When, therefore, Joseph had drunk in, in safety and had walked round the altar seven times, no sign of sin appeared in him. Then all the priests and the officers and the people justified him, saying, Blessed are you, seeing that no charge has been found good against you. And they summoned Mary and said, And what excuse can you have? Or what greater sign can appear in you that that the conception of your womb, excuse me, Or what greater sign can appear in you than the the conception of your womb, which betrays you? This only we require you. That since Joseph is pure regarding you, you confess who it is that has beguiled you. For it is better that that your confession should betray you than that the wrath of God should set a mark on your face and expose you in the midst of the people. Then Mary said steadfastly and without trembling, O Lord God, King over all, who know all secrets, if there be any pollution in me or any sin or any evil desires or or unchastity, expose me in the sight of all the people and make me an example of punishment to all. Thus saying, she went up to the altar of the Lord boldly and drank the water of drinking and walked round the altar seven times. And no spot was found in her. And when all the people were in the utmost astonishment, seeing 
excuse me, and when all the people were in the utmost astonishment, seeing that she was with child and that no sign had appeared in her face, they began to be disturbed among themselves by conflicting statements. Some said that she was holy and unspotted, others that she was wicked and defiled. Then Mary, seeing that she was still suspected by the people and that on that account she did not seem to them to be wholly cleared, said in the hearing of all with a loud voice, As the Lord Adonai lives, the Lord of hosts before whom I stand, I have not known man, but I am known by him to whom from my earliest years I have devoted myself. And this vow I made to God from my infancy, that I should remain unspotted in him who created me. And I trust that I shall so live to him alone and serve him alone. And in him, as long as I shall live, will I remain unpolluted. Then they all began to kiss her feet and to embrace her knees, asking her to pardon them for their wicked suspicions. And she was led down to her house with exultation and joy by the people and the priests and all the virgins. And they cried out and said, Blessed be the name of the Lord forever, because he he has manifested your holiness to all his people Israel. And I am going to wrap it up here. Uh, So tomorrow, Lord willing, we will read chapter 13. Okay. See what we have here. All right. Jill asked a question. I believe this is in the context of, of Hillel 2. Hillel 2. Uh, the question is, did he, that would be Hillel 2, did he believe in Messiah? Well, according to Epiphanius, he did. And that's why he, call, he called the Bishop of Tiberias and was baptized. Billy says, Evangelist Matthew. Yeah, apparently, that's what uh, they called... Um, Matthew, as in, i.e., the author of the Gospel of Matthew. Apparently, that's what they called him. As the author of this work called him Evangelist Matthew. Apparently, I believe, uh, you know, by definition, I suppose he could be an evangelist even just through his writing. I mean, he didn't really have to even travel. I, like, normally, today we think of an of, a, of an evangelist as someone who travels around. But uh, Matthew or whoever Matthew was, maybe he could have. Um, but being just the author, or at least supposed author of the gospel, uh, that would make him an evangelist anyway. The word evangelist, I believe, means messenger. Right? So, yeah, it's an interesting uh, way of putting it, isn't it? Great Deception says, Shalom, everyone. Shalom, Ellen. Welcome, welcome. Okay, well, um, yeah, so that'll make that'll uh, that'll be it for tonight. We'll wrap it up, and once again tomorrow, Lord willing, tomorrow we'll come back and we'll see if we can finish it tomorrow. Uh, finish the Gospel of Pseudo Matthew. Okay, and tomorrow is Arab Shabbat as well. Arab Shabbat again, so fast, right? So fast. All right, so. Lord willing, we'll do it again tomorrow, same time, same place, 7 p.m. Eastern. 
Uh, Great Deception says, thank you, brother, for your daily devotion to Yah's Torah. Much love and blessings to you all. Thank you very much, uh, Ellen. Love and blessings multiplied back to you. Billy says, uh, good night, blessings, and shalom, everyone. Good night and blessings and shalom as well. Return to you, Billy. Thank you very much. Okay. Thanks again, everyone. Appreciate you guys. You guys are awesome. Love you guys. I'll see you again tomorrow, Lord willing, 7 p.m. Eastern. Until then, as always, I pray the Lord bless you and keep you. Make his face to shine upon you. Lift up his countenance upon you and give you wonderful, wonderful shalom. Amen, amen. See you tomorrow.